you, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Institute of World Politics. My name is Frank Marlowe. I'm the Dean of Academics here. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Institute, there might be a few of you. We are a graduate school of international relations and state trend. We have five master's degrees. We have 17 certificates. We have a doctoral program. Uh, and we, uh, if you have any questions about any of those programs or interested in learning more about our programs, please feel free to approach me or anyone in the lobby. I'll be very happy to, to help you out. Uh, let me tell you, it's a, a great honor today to be able to introduce uh, Michael C. Maybach. Michael is a seasoned professional in global business diplomacy. He is an advisor mm -hmm. to nonprofit organizations, and he is a supporter of a number of civic causes. From 2003 to 2012, he was the president and CEO of the European American Business Council, which is a group of 75 multinational uh, companies. From 1983 until 2001, he was the Vice President of Global Government Affairs for the Intel Corporation. At Intel, he worked closely with its founders, uh, Dr. Robert Noyce, the inventor, uh, inventor of the integrated circuit, uh, Dr. Gordon Moore, known for Moore's Law, and Dr. Andy Grove, who was the Time Man of the Year in 1997. At Intel, he built a team of 150 professionals around the world to advance public policy to enhance trade, job, and wealth creation. Today, he is the founder and director of the Center for the Electoral College, which we'll obviously talk about today. He's also clearly an underachiever in that he has earned seven university degrees, <laughs> one of which was granted here uh, at the Institute of World Politics, and we're very proud to call him one of our alums. I don't know how he did seven of those, but I am impressed. Uh, I stopped at three, and that was plenty. Uh, while earning his first degree, he was elected the, to the DeKalb County Board in his native state of Illinois, becoming the first person elected to public office under the age of 21 in American history. No idea. Very impressive. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me <coughs> introduce Michael Mayer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do this. Do you... Is this working? Yeah, it works. Okay, good. I'm going to, if you don't mind, walk around a little bit. Thank you very much for coming. I assume that you're here because you care very much about our republic and its success, and uh, you want to know uh, why the founders developed this very unique part of our Constitution. Charles Black, who's a former professor of law at Harvard Law School, once wrote that to remove the Electoral College back in 1970 when the Congress was considering removing the Electoral College, would be the single most radical change <laughs> in the Constitution in American history. And we're going to talk about that institution today, about a 45-minute talk, and then your questions are very welcome. I want to start out with a question about our European friends. The European Union has how many countries? Since 28 until the UK, 27 as of next year. How many of those countries, uh, um, uh, just raise your hand if you know these, because I ask questions, you just raise your hand rather than we have six people answer. How many of those countries have popular election of their head of government? Who knows the answer to that of the 28? The answer is two Cyprus and France. All the rest elect their head of government through their parliament. That's the 28. This is the Electoral College of Great Britain. In other words, Boris Johnson was never on the ballot in Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland, only in England in his own borough. This is the Electoral College of Germany. The parliament elects Mrs. Merkel. She was never on the ballot across their country. This is our electoral college. 50 states have the electors meet the first Tuesday of the, of, the, of the month of December every four years. So we have 50 elections, if you will, much more democratic than most Japanese. Mr. Trudeau had just re-elected in Canada. He didn't serve in the, he didn't stand on the ballot in any place but his own constituency. Now, Winston Churchill said, the further you can look backwards, the further you can look forward. He said that because 
can thoughts on that? Because the nature of the human condition never changes. We love Shakespeare because the moral lessons still apply to our day, 600 years later. The founders believe that. That's why they're classical conservatives. A classical conservative is a person that believes man's nature is broken, problematic, always has been, always will be, so you have to guard against the problems of our nature. They, were, they studied history because they were going to create a new government. They had defeated the world's most powerful military, and now they were going to create a new government, and they wanted to get it right. These were very bright people, very ambitious, and they wanted to go down in history as successful to create a new republic. They studied Athens and why it fell because of the poor leadership of the elites, costly wars, the Peloponnesian Wars, very famous by Thucydides, who was the defeated general. That's why he had time on his hands to write that book, <laughs> which I studied here. Um, Plato came to write, tyranny naturally arises out of democracy. Rome went from a republic for 500 years to an empire. Augustus did away with the Senate's power. There was a Senate in, in the Roman Republic, ending the representative government of Rome and becoming Rome's first emperor. The Senate still met, but the emperor had all of the real power. They read these things in history. They also read Der Lock. One of the three portraits on Jefferson's wall in Monticello is of Locke and his second treatise. We get from Locke a very important idea. It's the divine right of kings is no divine right at all. The social contract theory, which is uh, representation. Uh, men have natural rights, life, liberty, property. Men have the right to revolution against tyranny. And we're endowed by our creator with our rights. And that's where Jefferson and other founders got this idea that we're endowed by our creator and, of course, the Common Sense and Thomas Paine also comes to mind as a book they read. A very, very, very important book was written by this Frenchman, Montesquieu, uh, in 1748. So the founders were very young men, and it's called The Spirit of the Laws. And he studied why democracies fail, large and small. And his conclusion was they failed because power was concentrated and majorities would tyrannize the minority. And so he came up with the idea, in a formal sense, of separation of powers to protect the minority from the majority by way of system of checks and balances. And as you can see from these two books, the founders took key ideas, as well as from others, the Scottish Enlightenment, etc. Now, we were operating uh, from the beginning days of the Revolutionary War until 1787 with Articles of Confederation, lots of weaknesses. There were trade wars between the states. The Congress could not tax people or the states. Uh, we had Shays' Rebellion, which is one of the reasons why we had the Constitutional Convention. Uh, the, the Congress could not raise an army. We had no national currency. There were no federal courts under the Articles of Confederation. It was really a very, very weak federation of 13 almost sovereign states. And there was no leader. There was no president, right? And so we had really the ingredients of legislative tyranny, which was very real among the 13 states. Lots of problems with legislative tyranny in the early days of the early constitutions. And so in the summer of 1787, Madison convinced George Washington to chair a constitutional convention. And uh, because Washington did attend and chair it, that's why most people said this must be serious because he was the great man who had won war, and he had such a high reputation. So in February 1787, they uh, invited delegates to come, and by May they had all arrived into Philadelphia, which was the largest city in the United States at the time. 55 delegates, 29 had college degrees, 34 were lawyers, 24 were serving in the Continental Congress, like James Wilson and 21 were military officers under Washington. So you had almost half of them former officers under Washington, and the other half were in the Continental Congress. So these were people well-educated. I mean, when you have 29 of them had college degrees in those days, my parents, they 
didn't have college degrees. Uh, you can see how unique they were. They also brought with them this line from the Declaration of Independence, and that is that to secure these rights, governments were instituted. And they had in mind, if we're going to institute a government, it's to secure rights. It isn't to control people so much. It's to secure our rights by making sure we have specific and reasonable and good government. Madison wrote, accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elected, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So here you have Montesquieu writ large, if you will. We cannot have power concentrated. Jefferson in his first inaugural, of course he was during the Constitutional Convention of Bastard <coughs> France, wrote in his inaugural, bear in mind this sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable that the minority possess their equal rights, with equal laws must protect, and to violate would be oppression. Okay? Matter of fact, people like George Mason in Virginia opposed the Constitution because it did not have a Bill of Rights. And Madison and Hamilton and others promised certain anti-federalists we would. In 1791, we did get a Bill of Rights. It was the first thing Madison worked on in the House of Representatives when he came to power. One person said to him, well, now that you've won and you have your constitution, why bother with the Bill of Rights? And he said, because it's important people, I promise, we're going to get it done. Ben Franklin described democracy as two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. <laughs> Liberty is a well-armed lamb <clears throat> contesting the vote. So this constitution making, uh, that is some of the background of the constitution making. The founders had three goals in the Constitutional Convention, I would suggest. Avoid tier majority tyranny by federalism, which is dividing power between the national government and states, and the checks and balances within those systems. So three branches in Richmond, Virginia, three branches in Washington, D.C. Number two, balance large and small state as well as regional interests. This was very, very important. The largest population was in Virginia, including West Virginia and Massachusetts, which included the state of Maine at the time, and Pennsylvania, which had the largest city, and New York. Those were the four big states of population. Next was North Carolina. But the other eight or nine were very, uh, Georgia only had 75,000 people, and Virginia had 750,000. So they had 10 times as many people as the people in Virginia, in Georgia. And therefore, this balance <laughs> has to be kept in mind on the Electoral College issue, of course. And then finally, created an independent, energetic president. And this is the other key. To understand the Electoral College, these founders wanted the president to be independent, unlike the Prime Minister of England, which they had dealt with, of the parliament, because they had seen what parliamentary majority tyranny was like, and they didn't like it. And when somebody at the Constitutional Convention said, let's have the Congress elect the president, Madison and others said, that's what we have in London, and we don't want that here. And the others, other one stood up and said, well, why do we have majority vote? And they said, yes, it'll always be a Virginian or somebody from Philadelphia or New York, and my state will never have a chance. Okay. The Electoral College supports all three of these goals. <clears throat> so in summary, they wanted federalism, robust federalism, and not a unitary state as we find in France and in Cyprus, by the way. The Federalist Papers, as you know, 85 essays written 18-month period during the debates because we had 13 conventions where people debated this constitution was adopted by those elected delegates to those conventions. The mindset of the founders in 1787 on selecting a president, and I'm going through this part because to understand the Electoral College, you have to understand what they're trying to accomplish in getting a president a certain way. An essential check on the tyranny majority an independent executive, essential to separation of powers. The president must not be chosen by Congress. They created the Electoral College over popular election to curb passions. Remember, democracy turns into tyranny, mob rule, if you will. <coughs> and of course, you just think of the, the French Revolution, which was just a year away, and you can see what uh, 
how democracy becomes so bloody. They invented the guillotine for the French Revolution because they were killed. So many people that had the mechanisms. Pure popular democracy uh, is a source of tyranny and the enemy of freedom. So these were Republicans in the political science sense of the term, not Democrats in the political science sense of the term. So, of course, we all know we have the three branches of government, and we want the House and Senate always to do battle. Remember, the Senate is the states. And originally, the senators were appointed by state legislatures until 1912, and the House by the people. So we have the states and the people with some fiction here. And this is one way to avoid majority tyranny inside the Congress. So we wanted, and, and Washington would write to people and say, one of the problems with the articles is there is no leader that can get these states to do anything, to stand up and say, go that way. And of course, he understood what executive leadership was about because he did that for seven years uh, in, the, in the war against England, Federal Senate. So now we're going to go through a few Federalist Papers. So if you're interested in further study, I'm going to give you the four Federalist Papers, 39, uh, 51, 68, and 70. Those are the four. So the first two by Madison, 39 and 51, and of course the 10th, which goes along with the 51st by Madison, and then Hamilton wrote 68 and 70 about the Supreme Court and the executive. So what uh, Hamilton says in Federal 70 is, there is an idea, which is not without its advocates, that a vigorous executive is inconsistent with the genius of Republican government. However, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. Energy in the executive. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign tax, is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws, to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupt the ordinary course of justice, to the security of liberty against the enterprises and assaults of ambition, of faction, and of anarchy. A feeble executive implies a feeble execution of government. A feeble execution is but another phrase for bad execution, and a government ill-executed, whatever it may be in theory, must in practice be a bad government. So in debates, always give the other person's argument. In this case, if you don't want an energetic executive, let's have a feeble one. How do you like that? And this was a very powerful rhetorical tool that he used. Madison, in 51, talks about having a president with a will of his own. In 51, he's talking about the balance of competing interests, including with the three branches of government. In order to lay a due foundation for that separate and distinct exercise of the different powers of government, which to a certain extent is admitted on all hands to be essential to the preservation of liberty. It is evident that each department should have a will of its own and consequently be so constituted that the members of each should have as little agency as possible in the appointment of members of the other. In other words, the Congress isn't going to appoint the president, the president doesn't appoint the Congress, and in the Supreme Court case, the president does appoint the Supreme Court, but guess who gets to ratify those nominations? States, not the House, the states. And that's why the Senate only votes on that, because again, the founders are involving the states. This is a nation of states. And so Rhode Island gets two votes, just like Pennsylvania and Virginia, on the Supreme Court issue, et cetera. So you see already uh, what they're trying to do is get all the states to see they have a role in this government, not just mere population. <laughs> It is equally evident that the members of each department should be as little dependent as possible on those of the others for the emoluments annexed to their offices. For the executive magistrate, the president, or the judges, not independent of the legislature in this particular, their independence of every other would be merely nominal, but the great security against the gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to resist encroachments of the other. Now, very often, my friends, my neighbors, whatever, say, isn't it terrible? We have gridlock in Washington. Oh, they just can't get in gridlock in Washington. And every night I thank God for gridlock in Washington. <laughs> because this system was designed for gridlock. It used to be. It is a blessing. It is a blessing because otherwise we will have a tyranny one part of our government. The 
fact that the president can veto, that the Senate has to can veto the Supreme Court nominations, on and on, and impeachment. We just had an impeachment trial. The House and, and Senate can impeach the president. These are all part of this system of checks and balances. Montesquieu on steroids, right downtown Washington. Nobody does it better in the world than we following Montesquieu. Now, Federal 51 goes on to say, and I love this quote, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. When Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich were going at it, I said, that's Federalist 51. Those two bright, ambitious guys are back and forth struggling for power. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself? But the greatest of all reflections on human nature. They really understood the broken nature of people and the fact that uh, abuses of government will happen. We have to have checks on that if we want to be free. And then he says another famous thing, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. No government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls of government would be necessary. In framing the government, which is to be administered by men over men, men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. We must first enable the government to control the government, the rule, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. To control itself. This is the hard work of self-government. It's not only rule, it's easy to rule people. You got a military, you can tax them to death, etc. It's another thing to control itself. And that's why the House controls the Senate, the Congress controls the President, on and on and on. In Republican government, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. The remedy for this inconvenience. The, the legislative tyranny is to divide the legislature into different branches, the House and Senate, to render them by different modes of election and different principles of action as little connect with each other as possible. The House is two-year elections. The Senate is six. The House is by population. The Senate is by the state. Two. So Rhode Island gets two senators and so does California. Okay? So they've totally mixed up the system so there is no harmony between them. In Republican government, the legislative, oh, sorry, it may even be necessary to guard against dangerous encroachments by still further precautions. An absolute negative on the legislature appears at first view to be the natural defense with which the magistrate should be armed. That's the veto. So now you're getting a deeper sense. Hamilton in Federal 68. If the manner talking about the Electoral College. This is his defense of the Electoral College, Federal 68. If the manner of it be not perfect, it is at least excellent. And I bet you when he wrote that, he was happy. It's at least an excellent solution. The Electoral College was decided on the last day of the Constitutional Convention. They'd given the least thought to how to elect the president. And it was the last thing they did because there were, their, their, their debates hadn't happened and the thoughts weren't developed. So they came up with this in just a few days on the way out of town. The sense of the people should operate in the choice of the person to whom so important a trust to be confided. That's the president. Not to any pre-established body. In other words, not elected by the House or the Senate, but to men chosen by the people for special purpose and the particular, at particular juncture, which is the time in the nation's life. It was equally desirable that the immediate election should be made by men most capable of analyzing the qualities adapted to the station and acting under circumstances favorable to the deliberation. This is the electors now, not the population, but the presidential electors that we all next November will elect in our states. And to a judicious combination of all the reasons and inducements which were proper to govern their choice. A small number of persons selected by their fellow citizens from the general mass will most likely possess the information and discernment requisite to such complication, complicated investigation. Remember, there was no TV, there was no radio, there was no internet, there was no mass communication. It's almost impossible for people in Virginia to know anything about anybody in Maine, or Massachusetts at the time, or um, in uh, North Carolina. How could they know? Only very successful people who had sort of a bigger view of the world, had been traveled and, and well-read and well-educated, 
people like the founders, would really listen to the popular vote and then to the extent that a change needed to be made, that they would make some judgment. What if a person had, in New York who was elected had died, but wasn't on the night, nightly news? I don't, these, these men of stature might know about that news more quickly, or they might know that, my gosh, they're actually in the, under the payroll of the British government or something, and that's been investigated, et cetera, et cetera. So they wanted to have sort of a final check on popular vote itself. To continue with 68, it was also peculiarly desirable to afford as little opportunity as possible to tumult and disorder. Precautions which have been so happily concerted in the system, promising effectual security against this mission. The choice of several, in other words, there's, there's lots of electors in each state. Several to form an intermediate body of electors will be much less apt to convulse the community with any extraordinary violent movements than the choice of one elector who will himself be the final object of the public's wishes. So they divide power again among the electors who then have to come to this conclusion. And as the electors chosen in each state are to assemble and vote in the state in which they're chosen, this detached and divided situation will expose them much less to heats and firmaments, so passion, which might be communicated from them to the people than if they were all to be convened at one time or one place. Remember I told you our electoral college happens in 50 capitals and not just one like they do in London or in, in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, finally, on 68, nothing was more to be desired than that every practical obstacle should be exposed to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. Remember, they were worried. Um, in Federalist, I think it's 30, 35, Hamilton writes, the Europeans would, um, would make us, make themselves to be the mistress of the world and um, regulate us into a new form of tyranny. They didn't like European meddling. This is way before the Monroe Doctrine. And they feared that the European governments would, uh, would infiltrate and talking about that these days, uh, these elections. These most deadly adversaries of the Republican government might naturally have been expected to make their approaches from more than one quarter, but chiefly from the design of foreign powers to gain an improper ascendance in our council. But the convention has guarded against all danger of this sort, the convention being the electoral college system, with the most provident and judicious attention. They have not made the appointment of the president to depend on any pre-existing bodies of men who might be tampered with beforehand to prostitute their votes, but they have referred it in the first instance to immediate act of the people. Remember, next November, the electors in each state are chosen and four weeks later, that didn't give you a lot of time to pay them off. Four weeks later, they're voting in the capitals, right? They're not members of the legislature. They're not members of Congress. They haven't been uh, corrupted by, by foreigners or other people. Um, so, but they have referred it in the first instance to the immediate act of people in America to be exerted in the choice of persons for the temporary and sole purpose of making the appointment. Those are the electors. Once you vote as elector, you're out of office. And they have excluded from eligibility to this trust. All those from situation might be suspected of too great a devotion to the president of office. So no senator, no congressman, no other person holding public office under the United States can be an elector, can be of the, thus without corrupting the body of the people, the immediate agents in the election will at least enter upon this task free of any senator by the sinister vices. So they wanted these to be citizens from among us who raise their hand and say, for example, I'm running as a presidential elector in Alexandria, Virginia. I put my name on the ballot and in May, I will be chosen or not chosen by my party to do that as a presidential elector. I hold no public office. The business of, of corruption, when it is to embrace, well, let me skip down here reading an awful lot. And the executive should be independent of his continuation in office and all but the people himself. He might otherwise be tempted to sacrifice his duty to compliance for those who favor what is necessary the duration of his official consequence. This advantage will also be secured by making his re-election depend on a special body of representatives. 
deputed or deputized by the society for the single purpose of making a choice. So these electors uh, don't work for the president, aren't public officials. Finally, electing the president involved the states. Remember, we had 13 states, most of them small, nine pretty small. Georgia, 75,000 people, for example. So in the popular election of the president, there were four ways they wanted to engage the states. Move the locus of president election out of the nation's capital. It wasn't a national vote, it was a state vote. This fits with the new compound Republican, as Madison called it in Federalist 51. The disaggregation of the presidential election among the states best ensured that the president would have continental reputation. And by thus involving the states, the people, and the state leaders feel they have an active role in state in choosing the head of government. Because every state capital will be where the president is elected, and electors will come from all 13 states. Finally, from Federal 51, there are two considerations particularly applicable to the federal system of America, which place that system at a very interesting point of view. First, in a single republic, all power surrendered by the people is submitted to the administration of a single government, and the usurpations are guarded against by a division of government into distinct and separate departments, checks and balances. In the compound republic of America, the power surrendered by the people is first divided, divided between two distinct governments, and then the portion allotted to each subdivide among distinct and separate departments. Hence, a double security. So we have a checks and balances in Washington, and then all the states that have checks and balances, what he calls, hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. You have power divided not only nationally, but in your state. The different governments will control each other at the same time that each will be controlled by itself. So the checks and balances will control Washington, the checks and balances in Springfield, Illinois, and the other capitals will control themselves, and of course, the states have litigation with the federal government and vice versa. They actually have their own tensions, as you know, states' rights. Second, it is of great importance in a republic not only to guard the society against the oppression of its rulers, but to guard one part of the society against the injustice of the other part. Different interests necessarily exist in different classes of citizens. The majority be united by a common interest, the rights of the minority will be insecure. So it's in Federalist 10 and 51 especially where he talks about uh, uh, making sure that we don't have um, interests so combined across the nation that we have a tyranny of a special interest, if you will. <clears throat> so in conclusion, 55 men in four months produced the world's oldest and I think best constitution in the summer of 1787. George Washington would later write to his friend Lafayette, it is the best constitution that can be obtained at this epoch or this era, given our history and our current circumstance. And Madison wrote in Federalist 37, I perceived the finger of the almighty hand at work in Philadelphia. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions that you have at this time. Yes, sir. Um, I did a study a while back. I took uh, the 15 largest countries population wise and uh, the eight that had the closest cultural ties to the U.S. that weren't on the list of the first. The point you mentioned earlier um, that 13 of them, of the 24, had a uh, parliamentary system or, in the case of the U.S., the electoral college. So something very similar. The electoral college, the same basic idea uh, as far as uh, you know, having people who in turn or elected who in turn elect the uh, the leader, and then and then the remainder of uh, uh, two of them were China and Vietnam that don't have meaningful elections, uh, and then the rest uh, except for three were they had part they had a, a popular vote like France but with a runoff, so yeah. you didn't have somebody elected <coughs> with a, a minority in the vote in the in, right. the, in the first round. I think uh, the ones that left Mexico, the Philippines, and then Nigeria, I think, had a mixed system. It was a popular vote, but you had to get 25% in each of the states. So it was kind of a, a mixture. Uh, so my question based on that is, were 
countries, uh, obviously the parliamentary system precedes the existence of the electoral, U.S. electoral college. But uh, did countries come to the, to the conclusion that the popular vote, for various reasons, is not a practical way of running a large country or a Western country? Uh, because it seems to be a pattern uh, that's uh, you know, overwhelming. Uh, and uh, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, to give a detailed question, I think the short answer is the French Revolution really showed how things could go bad so quickly with the mob. Um, people that develop governments with those kind of checks, like the, the parliament's elected, and then, you know, we have a two-step policy. We have a popular vote, and then we have electoral college, which elects the president. The British have popular vote, then they have the parliament, which elects the prime minister. So there's steps involved here. These are all by way of guarding our freedom. The people that write these constitutions are clear, I think, by and large, about the nature of human <coughs> Man's nature is broken. And plus, if you, if you look at popular democracies, they have major, major problems um, when they're what we call a simple republic or a pure, sorry, uh, a simple democracy or a pure democracy. The Republican government's the only one, I think, modesty was right, that really gives you a chance at success. And still then, it's really hard. Um, we have lots of people who want to change our constitution, and uh, that's why I'm giving these talks because you know, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact that has now 15 state legislatures that have voted to do an end run around the, the Electoral College because they can't get a constitutional amendment. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, can states apportion uh, their electors? Can they punish faithless electors? Good questions. Um, states can. Two states, um, Maine and Nebraska, have a hybrid system, which is each congressional district uh, elects an elector, and then they have at large as well, the, the two senators. So they divide it up, those two states. So states, we have um, uh, 11 congressional seats in Virginia and then two senators. Um, we could have 11 electors from congressional districts that then vote rather than the statewide system. But by and large, states don't do that because then presidential candidates really don't want to pay attention to them because the electoral votes are not aggregated, they're disaggregated. They might win two congressional districts and lose two, becomes a Washington center. So it's not in the benefit of a state that wants attention from the presidential candidates in the electoral college system to dilute themselves by disaggregating their votes. On the faithless electors, that's it's never been challenged there's been about 30 faithless electors in the history of the Electoral College, which is our Constitution's history, and about 30 some. And they've never made a difference. Usually it's just a protest vote. You know, I'm not going to vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. I'm going to vote for George Washington or something like that. Just try to make a point or somebody's disgruntled, et cetera. But in the case of Colorado in 2016, there was a Democrat elector who said he was going to uh, – not vote for, I believe it's true, Mrs. Clinton. I think I have the facts on this right. And the uh, Secretary of State replaced him with an elector that would be faithful to the vote of the state because he had announced before the vote he was going to change it. That's before the U.S. Supreme Court this year. And I think he'll win, which is that the state uh, uh, elected officials cannot meddle with the vote of an elector who's been chosen by their party or otherwise chosen in the state, whatever the state provides. I hope those are helpful. I think we'll see this year the Supreme Court say, you can be faithless. Because as you see, the founders really thought, what if somebody dies and people don't know? What if somebody has really uh, you know, been proven to accept cash from the British and God knows what? We need to save the union, if you will, from uh, something that most people just didn't know. Of course, we have 24 seven news now, so frankly, everybody knows just about everything. Yes, yes, ma'am, and then, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think it's fair to say that if we had a popular vote result in every state, you'd have the same cumulative problem, which is, by the time everybody, let's say, east of the Mississippi is voted, 
whether it's electoral vote or it's popular vote, because those totals come in. If you live in Hawaii or Alaska or California, you know, in different time zones, I mean, it, I think Hawaii is seven time zones from here, something like that. Six, is it six time zones? Um, I think would be the same. That's why I think it, um, it's a good idea for our news media, which are not regulated, <laughs> you know, the First Amendment, et cetera, um, to give a lot of thought to how they report on those things, because you don't want to chill the vote some of the things. That said, there's a lot of people on the ballot. If there's a presidential name, there's a U.S. Senate, there's a Congress, there's a state legislature, maybe a governor. Depends on the year and what state, because they all have different cycles. But there's a lot more reasons to vote every every four years than just for president. So you might say, okay, well, my presidential candidate is not going to win, but I really want this mayor or this governor or this congressman. So um, who wants to not, not vote because they think something might happen to one of these? Nothing's perfect in this world. We have, we have obviously six time zones. I mean, sir, you have a question? Yeah, how would you respond to the argument that the interests of this country have become nationalized? So people in Delaware care about the same things largely as people in California. So it doesn't matter if, you know, people in Delaware votes are Democrat, California will vote for Democrat. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if Delaware has three electoral votes, yeah. California will have to back. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I do think that. Even the founders would say our states are very different, but they do have certain things in common, et cetera. Um, the question I like to ask in this particular conversation is, do you believe in minority rights? Because uh, respectfully, I think the basis of your question is, well, we're just one country, so let's just have a national popular vote. And if that's the case, there's more people in Los Angeles County than 30 of our states. New York has more people than all of Virginia. Sussex County um, in, in uh, Long Island has more people than 10 of our states. If we go to a pure popular vote, there's a lot of people in a lot of states that feel like this is now a big city government elected just by population centers. So, um, Yes, we all have some things in common, but there's regional differences. There's, you know, I mean, I used to live in California, and the mindset there is very different than Alabama. There's lots of, you know, so if we're for diversity and we're for minority rights, this is a great system, I think. But, you know, it's, it's a fair question. Uh, we're all Americans, but we're all citizens of a state. We vote in our states. The state runs our elections. The government, national government does Other questions? Yes, sir. And John. I wonder if the framers thought or frustrated about the fact that you could have a candidate that could win the popular vote and the president is elected by the Yeah. Did they predict this? Like what we No, they didn't even have political parties. Remember? They thought just they just thought men would run. The whole idea of the party came along. When Jefferson, Madison split with Hamilton and Washington during the first administration of Washington over France and lots, lots of issues, the National Bank. <laughs> There's a Hamiltonian idea that Jefferson and others didn't like. So the parties developed by 1800. Of course, Jefferson's getting elected, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had three instances where the person that gets the popular vote did not um, win the uh uh, election because the electoral college went the other way. Uh, that was Gore, Bush, Bush and Gore, uh, Clinton and Trump, and then uh, actually there's two more, 1876 and 1888. Very, very close, within 100, 300,000 votes, etc. A couple of things. One, if you're a uh, if you're a federalist. Uh, George Bush, who lost to Gore by, I think it was 300,000 votes, something like that. I'm sure people can look it up. He won 30 states and Gore won 20 states. Something, yeah. Um, in the case of Trump, if you remove California's vote, both for Clinton and for Trump, Trump won the nation. The only difference was California. It was the only, the, the huge numbers, there are 40 million people. Lots of the illegal people, et cetera. California gives a driver's license to the illegal, et cetera, et 
et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, it's an imperfect system. But uh, Abraham Lincoln got the lowest number of votes of sort of percentages of any presidential candidate who won. Uh, how much, what percentage of votes did he get? 39.5%. Only because the Electoral College did we even have a president on the run up to the Civil War because there were five people running. And two Democrats, one in the South and one in the North, Stephen Douglas, and then Lincoln, and then I think it was Governor Clinton in New York, I believe, ran, and there was one other. So the country was very divided. Only because we had the Electoral College did we even have a president, because Lincoln won more states than everybody else, right? We are a nation of states. Right? And then finally, if you're a World Series fan, baseball, you got to bring baseball in there somehow. Is it the over seven games, the, the, the team that gets the most runs or the most games? It's the most games. We've had four World Series that I know about where the losing team scored more runs over the seven games. But we, we go by the number of games, not the number of runs. Well, this is sort of, our system is roughly, I don't think we've ever had a president elected that didn't have the majority of the states or the, the most number of states. So it's, a, it's an imperfect system, but nothing is perfect. Remember, they weren't worried about majority rule so much as minority tyranny and one region dominating another region. John, you have a question? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Um, so, fellow um, uh, in California who invented the scratch off lottery ticket technology. So, it's a very wealthy. Every time you scratch off a lottery ticket, he makes money. Right? Um, and he uh, was a fan of Albert Gore, who lost to Bush in the Supreme Court case. In the end, the Florida recount court case. And he decided to dedicate some money to getting rid of the Electoral College. But the only, we need 38 states to do it, and the small states aren't going to let New York and L.A. run the country, at least not willingly, okay? So two professors, uh, last name Manar, Amari, uh, came up with, the political science professors, came up with this idea, you know, the... Uh, Every state's in charge of how the elector, electors are chosen and delineated. Why don't we pass a state law in, in enough states to have 270 electoral votes, a state law that says no matter how our state people, the people in our state vote, our electors shall vote in favor of whoever wins the national vote. It's called the National Popular Voter, National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. They have a website. They're hugely well-funded. They mostly hire Republican lobbyists in states to get Republicans to vote for this. 15 states have now passed this. In Virginia, tomorrow in the state Senate, the delegates in the House uh, in Richmond have already voted for this yesterday. If they vote for it tomorrow, uh, uh, Virginia will be the 16th state. Right now, they're up to 196 electoral votes. The compact's identical language says it won't go into effect until we have enough states and we have 200, we control this, 270 electors, right? And um, his name's John Cuso, the fellow that supports this. He's well-meaning. He thinks that I believe in majority rule and these states are just in the way. And we should have, you know, he's in California where we have 40 million people, et cetera. Um, and so that's a very well-funded effort. In the first article of the Constitution, it says the states shall not have compacts without the permission of the U.S. Congress. And the Congress hasn't even had a hearing on this. Um, but they haven't over the years uh, exercised this power because it's mostly over water rights or the Port of New Jersey and the Port of New York have some sort of a compact, et cetera. It's never been to affect the Constitution. So if they get enough votes to do this, we'll have a constitutional crisis. 
the Supreme Court will probably have to decide this. I hope that doesn't happen. We'll see. But it's a major threat to this. And I think if we if we would get rid of the Electoral College, um, we'll have all kinds of anarchy. Well, the two-party system will go away. You know, if you think, of, think about Europe, um, Israel is now, what, on their 12th week without a prime minister because they have a multi-party system and they can't decide, right? Um, Boris, Boris Johnson had a run again because he and Mrs. Uh, uh, May, thank you, were both minority. They had to get a coalition, etc. The Italian Senate, uh, the same way, etc. Europe is full of Mrs. Merkel is a minority chancellor, etc. When you don't have a two-party system like we do, you have a whole bunch of coalitions. So how do you speak, get a Speaker of the House if you had five or six American parties that had had clout? Except they'll, they'll be a Green Party, they'll be a Libertarian Party, because you don't worry about states anymore. You see, Eugene Debs got 30% of the vote, and so did Ross Perot, and they got zero electoral votes. A third of the country, and they got zero. What that told people was, you got to join one of the two parties, or you can't even have any hope of becoming president of the United States. Our system of electoral college has created a two-party system that served 310 million people very well versus six or eight or 12 parties. Just think if we had that guy. How would we decide anything? You think that we have gridlock now. So you have to think through these things. We have a wonderful system. It's not perfect, but the alternative the other thing is, some states um, allow uh, uh, convicted criminals to vote when they get out of prison. Others don't. Some states, in Virginia, we can vote for weeks before the election. Others, election day only. Some are open 12 hours. Some, some they have two-day voting, etc. Some have mail-in ballots. On and on. We have 50 different election systems, which means if we went to a popular vote, guess what? The Federal Election Commission would have to take over the elections of all 50 states to make the rules correct. And then we are friends, right? Then we do have a single system because the alternative to the electoral college is every state law has to be identical. By, by the way, why are the states even running these elections? They're not involved with the electoral college anymore, et cetera, et cetera. But we, <laughs> if you want to really have secession, you get rid of the electoral college and then other than major cities, People like, you know, well, people that are very wealthy that are campaigning right now will just put money in Chicago, New York, Miami, Houston. Why would they ever go to New Hampshire in the winter or Iowa? Why would they? There's, there's as many cattle there as there are people, right? I mean, why would they go there except for the two-party system that we have? So um, we have a wonderfully imperfect system, as, as Hamilton said. It's not perfect, it is excellent, because the problems of self-government are so problematic. Other questions? And sir, I think you have a question. Yeah, well, basically, you already have that. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I would kind of agree with you that uh, without the electoral college, uh, the, the most states uh, we must have uh, a say in this presidential election. We go in uh, the sense of a change of yeah. a few strong. Yeah, New York or Los Angeles. But it seems that uh, you are excluding the possibility of having an electoral college of elections. States have the right to do that. Okay, the state of Virginia could have 11 electors from 11 districts and then two at large, they could do just what Nebraska and Maine. But then the winner, we adopted from the British many good things. One was the first past the post, or winner takes all. And that is a system that, in, that engenders a two-party system. It tells minorities uh, that they, minority interests, that they have to join a larger tent in order to play, if you will. And so the, um, the electoral system, electoral college um, system, because it's winner take all in every state, makes it attractive. Remember, um, uh, I think it was 
was George Bush's second election, not against Gore, but against John Kerry, where if it wasn't for West Virginia and New Mexico, he wouldn't have won. I have to look at those numbers. I'm talking about five electors here and four here or whatever. So in the Electoral College, because the math is so different than popular vote, just 270 versus 200 million, if you will, Winning one or two states may, may, may be all the difference. And so they have to visit West Virginia. They have to go to New Mexico, unless they're totally a blue or a red state. And those states were toss-ups. And he went to them and convinced enough people, and sometimes by 10,000 votes, that they won. But, but our system, and remember, when I first moved to California in 1978 after college, it was a... It was a purple state. We, we had lots of Pete Wilson, George Bush. We had Republican governors, Reagan, et cetera. And it was a back and forth. Now it's totally one party. I grew up in Illinois where we had Senator Percy and Senator Dirksen and Senator um, Paul, Paul Simon. Thank you. We had both parties. And we had, we had Republican and Democrat governors, et cetera. And then states changed. You know, there's some states that used to be swing and now are in, in competition. The, the solid South used to be all Democratic. Now it's mostly Republican, et cetera. So states are in play and they're in flux all the time. Virginia. Virginia used to be reliably Republican. Now, of course, the whole legislature is Democratic. So um, this, our population changed, the times changed, and this system over 200 and some years now <laughs> served us pretty well. Uh, yes, ma'am. Speaking of that, in 2020, 21st century, you said it's you know it's not perfect or it's excellent. It's not to dissolve it. Could it be normalized and improved in any way? It's a good question. Um, I I don't think so. Um, I think that I think the problem is in our politics, not in our Constitution. Um, until the 2016 election, I, we don't have any history that I'm aware of in American history of a resistance. Not my president. Uh, when I was in high school, because I was interested in history, We have parties. I'm not so There's that's a whole nother lecture and that's all times, right? And now we have it. We have this Association when he was about 37 years old. Um, think about this. Leap over the Atlantic and conquer America. The only way America would be conquered is if we conquer ourselves. Hundred miles from where he grew up. And he was talking then to the Young Men's Christian Association, I'm pretty sure the young man's son. talks about his concern about the future. That What he had in mind, I think, was we were on the way to civil war, which is to say the least. Uh, and I think this is a psychology. 
written constitution like this is we have it since the Civil War. In the condition to our people, and that's a tough thing to do. That nature of the population today. Not seen. represent the people in the states sufficiently to make a question. Is that a simple question? This I think that so. Minority leader in the Republican Party for 20 years or whatever. And the speaker was, by and large, And one of the nice things about that members of Congress from that generation, my parents' generation, governed so well because they knew. The party was interesting, but the country was much more important. Um, we haven't had a war like that. To matter of fact, every war we've had since has pretty much divided the country, especially Vietnam and Iraq. I think when America chooses wars, I think we choose that one. Um, it's just it's never helped us at all. It's hurt us an awful lot. Um, but there, there has been in our politics help, John. Um, uh, adoption of some of the some of the thoughts that came from the Scottish Enlightenment, which is our founders, and from the French Enlightenment, which informed the French Revolution. And if you read um, Os Guinness's recent book, you'll get the sense of this. Um, I, I believe that especially our educators, and I'm talking about K through 12, especially including university professors as well. Um, there's not nearly the admiration for this republic and for what we've inherited as we used to have. And when you don't admire what you inherit, then you can do all you can to take it down, like the National Popular Republic used to accommodate it, right? So I think Going back to this lady's question about what would you change, I think unless civic education includes um, uh, positive words about what we've inherited as a country, the oldest constitution in the world, as opposed to, you know, Washington was a slaveholder. Well, in Washington's day, every country in the world had slaves. It was the norm, right? The great thing about the founders were they didn't end slavery. Jefferson started the debate. When you write all men are created equal and you're a slaveholder, you put in the mind of every American that reads those words, well, then why do we have slaves? Right? And we've 
750,000 people died before we settled that question. But the American founders put in play that in a way that lots of other countries um, didn't do or don't provide the freedom. There's a million, 300, a million, 300 million people in China that are not free and don't get to make any of these decisions. So I think we're very fortunate, but not everybody who teaches anymore thinks that. I think that's essential. Our institutions, you know, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci from Alabama, he studied that at IWP, you know, arch through the institutions. And so we, we've got quite a challenge we want to keep this republic. As Ben Franklin said when he was walking out of the, uh, uh, the Independence Hall, a woman asked him, Dr. Franklin, this is the end of the Constitutional Convention, what have you given us? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. Republic if you can keep it. Maybe with that we should conclude, but I'll be around if you have other questions. Thank you.